They've been growing organic grains in Denmark for quite some time. Farmers tend to learn best from other farmers. Millers, bakers, key players all along that bread meat food chain. This is definitely my favorite stop yet. A few years ago, I visited Per Grupa, whose wide row planting system inspired research in Maine. More recently, he's working with agronomist Anders Borgen on a four-year project funded by the Danish government. Their goal is to evaluate and identify cereal varieties from, from the gene bank for growing and baking characteristics that are good for organic production. A number of heritage varieties rediscovered in the last few years, like Öland's wheat and a hardy rye from Finland, have already become popular among the growers we visited. We have a, a variety of wheat, it's called Svedero, and it uh, means that you burn, in old times you burn the forest, and then you, yeah, saw this. And it's uh, very small seeds, and it tasted good. The family is tired of using this. I use it in bread, in soup, everything. <laughs> and I think you um, have to taste it. This is the rye or this, the... This is rye. Summer rye. That's, uh, midsummer rye. Yeah, midsummer, midsummer rye. rye. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Mm. The heritage varieties. Mm. What characteristics are you evaluating for? So we are looking for the quality, the taste, and of course, yield. Uh, for instance, in, in the old varieties, very old varieties in barley, we have a, a, a low uh, a low yield, so you have to have a higher quality. We can't say we are not interested in money because we are interested in, in, in this uh, quality and, and, uh, and yield. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the to, to, to to normal, to the conventional, they are only interested in yield. And, 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 and that's a big mistake. But somebody has to pay, and, we, and, and it must be the consumers. And, uh, and yeah, we are all consumers, and then we have to say, here is a, a, a taste and a quality we like. We'll pay more for it. This year we have an awful harvest in, in August with rain all day. <laughs> and uh, I could do nothing. And when I harvest uh, the spring wheat, was uh, uh, falling number was here. Yep. Last so, last summer growing season for us was the same. This year is perfect. Yeah. Nice snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We took your weather. <laughs> Our tractor is nearly too small to, to, to go with this machinery. So this is how you see your winter wheat. Yeah. We use it for everything, the seeding of cereal, not curling. Before growers can plant, they need access to clean seed. And yet an emerging problem for organic producers is seedborne diseases. In northern Jutland, we visited Paris research partner Anders Borgen, who was instrumental in arranging much of our tour, as he's familiar with researchers, farmers, and millers throughout Denmark. I'm a small grain breeder. I would say I'm a very small grain breeder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anders is passionate about preserving and using genetic diversity. Jersey, that is beautiful, it's blue. Yeah, this is not a purple wheat, this is a blue wheat. Um, this means that the, the color is in the pericarp, whereas in the, in the purple wheat. And I think today you're, you're mostly interested in wheat. Um, and that's also what we are sowing right now. So maybe we should go in the field and we can look there. I call it a field, it's more like a garden. <laughs> when I work with, with winter wheat, the main focus is um, baking quality and common bond. Are you all familiar with common bond? Maybe we should. I'll, I'll show you. This looks just like wheat, right? Um, and inside wheat we have this white flower, but but if it's infected with bunt, um, it uh, looks like this. Um, it's black inside. It's a quite a nasty you disease. Would, would you not want it near your your new seedings here? Or? But this is all infected. So it's about 400 different varieties that I've infected with this smut, uh, and then I'll see which varieties are resistant and which are susceptible. And these are mainly gene bank material. 
I would say if it's susceptible, then I don't need to test it again because it is susceptible. If it's resistant in this drive, then I will take it, treat it again because maybe I forgot to put spores or maybe it was just this year. So uh, you need three years to confirm that it is resistant, but you need only one year to confirm that it is susceptible. Common bunt is not a problem for growers in the U.S. yet, but there's concern that it will become one in the future. While seed companies can get conventional treated seed and then grow it out under organic conditions, organic producers who are using saved seed have limited options. And when I take seed from my farm that is completely contaminated mm -hmm. with bunt, uh, then I, I need to treat the seed before sending seed out from here. Did you have any luck with the organic seed treatments or no? Obviously. Yes, they work, yes. Uh, they don't work 100%, but they work maybe 95 percent something like that. I, I treat it with mustard, uh, mustard flour. Uh -huh. um, meal? Like yes. mustard meal? From yeah. The yeah, because it's it's more effective if you use it as uh, if you mix it with water uh -huh. and it, especially if you, if you mix it with uh, with vinegar, French vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. I worked also with, with milk powder which is very effective. I mi mix it with water and apply it as a, as a liquid. It acts as, as a nutrient for a, a soil a microorganisms. Mm. Um, so milk powder actually works quite well. You need quite a high dose, but uh, so it's a little impractical to work, uh, to work with. But, uh, but if you combine the milk powder with trichoderma or some other active uh, antagonist, mm. uh, th then it's quite effective. Another take-home strategy we learned of in Denmark is the use of brush cleaners. For seed cleaning, Anders said that brush cleaners can reduce bunt spore numbers by up to 90%. In New England, our major disease concern is fusarium head light, which produces a toxin that can contaminate the grain. Some of the millers in our group saw potential in the use of brush cleaners to reduce this contamination during the cleaning process. Starting with the first organic legislation in 1987, Denmark has shown a strong commitment to increasing organic production through research and extension and subsidies for conversion. That commitment has really paid off. Right now, about 7% of Danish agricultural land is in organic production, compared to less than 1% in the U.S. Recently, the Danish government has set an ambitious goal as part of its green growth plan to double the area under organic production by 2020. This commitment drives the practical research of people like Ilsa Rasmussen, who's worked extensively in weed management and organic cereals. The, the key challenges in bread wheat production are getting enough nitrogen for both yield and quality, and also that uh, if we have crop, cropping systems without livestock, then we pretty easily get some crop rotations where we get a lot of weed problems, especially perennial weed problems. What are the primary methods of managing weeds for cereal, organic cereal producers in Denmark now? Well, for the annual weeds, we use a lot of uh, weed harrowing, uh, where we go out in the springtime, already before the spring cereals would emerge, we go out with the first uh, weed harrowing and follow it up once or twice uh, with the later weed harrowings. We can also do this in winter wheat. Usually we don't start in the autumn because we have a very wet autumn, but sometimes if it's if the weather fits for it, we will do it already in the autumn, but otherwise in the spring. Uh, another method is to make wider rows where we can do some hoeing between the rows, um, which is quite effective also against some of the perennial wheat problems that we have. But as soon as we stop doing the hoeing, then the white rows give more room for the weeds to grow. So it, it's again an offsetting uh, position we have here. Um, and we think a lot about all the preventive things that we can do. For example, sowing time. Against annual wheat, sowing uh, winter wheat a little bit later than you would do ordinarily is a, is a good method in, in our conditions. Obviously having a high uh, uh, number of plants per square meter and also competitive varieties is important because and this is against both annual and perennial weeds the competition from the crop is really the most important tool that we have to keep down the weeds. This is David who's going to um, show you the machinery here. Oh. 
looking at very interesting, very nice equipment that I would love to have any number of pieces of it, but it also gives you ideas of how to retrofit existing equipment that we have in Maine um, to do similar tasks. Like there's old rollers and things around that you can modify into, you know, like for instance, this piece of equipment there, they're doing their finished bed prep and seeding grain in one pass, which wouldn't actually be that difficult for us to make something like this uh, if you have the right two pieces of equipment and you know some torches and some MIG welder. And where we're sort of market scale farmers as well as dairy farmers, we, uh, we like the idea of being able to control weeds in the row instead of just relying on one cultivation tool such as a Laylee. In-row cultivation for grains is happening only in the universities in you know, the U.S. Very other, very, very small amount of that going on. Using wider rows that allow cultivation between the rows is one strategy that organic grain growers are using in northern Europe. But for the most part, farmers rely on tying harrows. Harrows are used most effectively uh, before the crop emerges and then again for a two-week period after the crop has reached the two to three leaf stage. At Copenhagen University's Tostrup Research Center, Jesper Rasmussen talked to us about another aspect of optimizing time weeding. Timing is not very important if you are able to choose the optimum intensity. Because if, if, you're, if you're going out in the field later, you have to, to make a more aggressive treatment. I think the most important thing is it is to be able to, to choose the best intensity, the best aggressiveness of harrowing. And that's at the same time a very, it's a very difficult decision because it's a trade-off between damaging the crop and killing the weeds. And um, I think the farmers, they, they know to handle it to a certain extent, but as a scientist, um, of course, we want to improve the, the knowledge uh, behind those decisions. And that's uh, the reason that we develop and are working with the models that, that try to balance the trade-offs between crop damage and weed control. Jesper explained that if tine harrowing is too intense, soil cover can set the crop back as if it were planted late and impact yields. However, if harrowing is too light, it won't kill the weeds. He and his colleagues are working with image processing software to determine crop soil cover so that researchers and farmers can pay closer attention to that interaction between tillage intensity and crop yields. To get an impression of how is my crop affected by herring, you can take an ordinary camera, even your mobile phone, you can take pictures, you can upload the, the, the pictures to this program and it's free to use and you can get the data immediately. If you establish a very competitive crop and, and, and the mechanical weed control would interact in a positive way, but this is not the situation in, in this case. Our research colleagues gave us a lot to think about, both in terms of the practical methods and also the broader principles and future of organic agriculture. Denmark is host to the International Center for Research in Organic Food Systems, which coordinates research efforts at a European level. This is Niels Halberg, the center's director. We can use more knowledge, in biological knowledge, in terms of how to, to use uh, biological mechanisms uh, for improving our crop or livestock production, uh, resilience and, and, and so on. And that, and that in intensification in terms of use of knowledge and ecological principles is what we call eco-functional uh, intensification. And if you use that as a paradigm, you also illustrate that organic agriculture is not a set system which we have already invented, but it's a development pathway trying to find the sustainable agriculture for the next century to, to be kind of grand. For more information about the Northern New England Local Breadweed Project, visit us at extension.umaine.edu slash localwheat. Mm -hmm.